So a very good evening to you all here at uh, Wolfson, whether you're in the auditorium with us today, um, or whether you are watching at home, or whether you're watching later on, watching the recorded version. Um, we are delighted to welcome Professor Adil Najam to Oxford University and to Wolfson College. Uh, he joins a distinguished group of scholars, activists and artists who've given this annual Safraz lecture, <coughs> named after one of the college's generous benefactors and focusing on an understanding of contemporary Pakistan. He is currently Professor of International Relations and of Earth and the Environment at Boston University and a leading public policy scholar whose teaching, research and public engagement focuses on the international environment and development policy, global governance, diplomacy and negotiation, as well as South Asia and higher education. Um, and he also knows a lot about cricket. Um, Professor Najam has taught at MIT, where he completed his graduate and doctoral studies. Uh, 2002 to seven, he was uh, Associate Professor of Negotiation and Diplomacy at the Fletcher School of Law at Tufts. Um, from 2007, as the director of the Frederick S. Party Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future at Boston University, he led an expansion of interdisciplinary research at the center. And then in 2011, he moved to Pakistan again as vice chancellor of LUMS, which people will know, the Lahore University of Management Science, which is Pakistan's top ranked university and one of South Asia's premier institutions of higher education. Um, and while he was there, he led a huge fundraising campaign, yielding over $30 million in endowments, congratulations, um, as well as strengthening the scholarship program for students from the very poorest backgrounds. And it's no coincidence that in 2011, he was elected a trustee of the International Board of the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Having worked for 20 years on and with the UN system, Professor Najam is an acknowledged international expert on global governance, and he has served as a convening lead author for the IPCC, focusing on the relationship between climate change and sustainable development. We're delighted you are here, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much for, um, uh, for, for embarrassing me by reading that CV. Clearly, my greatest skill is writing my own bio. Uh, but it's a great, great pleasure to be here and, and, and to be with friends new and old. Uh, and to, to, to give this lecture, which, as you said, has been given by some very illustrious people and people one has um, the highest regard and respect for. Um, I'm going to talk about, about climate change, and I'm going to talk about climate change in the Pakistan context, but not necessarily about climate change in Pakistan, and I hope you will see why. Um, I, want to, I want to connect that. And before I do that, I also wanted to congratulate the college for the very bold steps you are taking. Uh, in terms of, of, of your own um, climate change work. So, so, so thank you on behalf of the planet um, for, <laughs> for all, 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 all of that. Um, um, as, as, as was mentioned, I work on issues of climate change and have uh, for the last many years. I look at climate change uh, from particularly from a policy perspective and for a very long time from an international negotiation perspective. Uh, and, and this will be reflected in, in what I say, in how the world has tried to, not successfully in my view, grapple with this global challenge of coming together uh, to, to, to deal with it. Um, and I, I say this because I work at the same time, uh, really, I, I come to climate from a development perspective, and you'll see this too. So, so those, two, those two caveats I wanted to, wanted to put in uh, right, right at, the, at the beginning. Uh, what I want to do in, in the next half an hour or so is to raise three questions. I promise not to answer any of them, uh, which will leave us with, with the opportunity to actually have a conversation. But they're also not the type of questions that can be answered 
or should be answered by one person because they're the type of questions which I hope uh, lead to thinking about other questions. And the first of those is not what the cop is telling us. So it's, it's interesting how, how you can say the cop and assume everyone knows what that means. You obviously always do, Benito, but now the world seems to know what a cop is, which is a really sad statement. <laughs> Right? The world, world should have better things uh, to do than understand what a, what a COP, a conference of the parties is. But, but the first question really is, what is the climate telling us? And, and this is central to my argument. Uh, I'll put an argument up right there, which is that we live in what I have been calling the age of adaptation. It is not that we will go into the age of adaptation, that we are there. And so the first question I want us to think about as you, as you listen to, uh, see what I have, is what is the climate telling us? The second is, what can Pakistan, or countries like Pakistan, tell us about what it means to live in this thing that I'm calling the age of adaptation? Suddenly, and again, unfortunately, there is much that the world can learn from Pakistan. You will see why I say unfortunately. And the last is, how should Pakistan think about this age of adaptation in the context of climate development and security. Now, you, you, you could say that's everything, climate, development, security. And I would say, yes, thank you for noticing. <laughs> so so those, that's, that's, the, that's the idea. And I want to do this by, by telling you a story. Uh, and that those of you who work on Pakistan know we tell lots of stories, so you'll hear a story. Uh, and it's a story um, that will move from the planetary, literally the planetary, to the international, to the very local. And, 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 and that's, 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 that's the plan for, for what I want to do. Uh, let me start, therefore, by being silly. Uh, at least deans in the US are allowed to be silly. Is that OK? Is, is, do I have your permission? So I'm going to be silly. Uh, and, and please play along with me. Um, assume for a moment, assume for a moment, there's a reason. Assume for a moment that you are not at Oxford. Assume that you're not in the UK. Assume you're not even on planet Earth. Assume you're on some other planet. Choose your planet. There used to be nine. Now they say there are eight. At least one of them is not doing very well. Choose your planet. And on that planet, assume that you have been asked to write a country report on this place called Earth. Two pages or less, 12 point times Roman, no footnotes. If someone was looking down at us, what would they see? If someone in the FCO or the World Bank, the type of country reports that they write about, what type of country would we, the planet Earth, be, how would we, we, we be described? Right? Now, this is not about silly ideas like sort of one government and all of that. But we keep talking global, right? Uh, global climate change, global finance, global pandemic, akuna matada, everyone together. But if there is actual real value in the term global, maybe this will help us think about it. You can tell the story in multiple ways. I will choose to tell it only one. I can tell the same story in the opposite way. But allow me to tell the story in this way. You will come to the conclusion, if you tell the story this way, that you live on a very poor planet that you live in a poor country, that 2 billion people on the planet live, live on less than a dollar a day, that a billion people in this country called Earth live on less than two and a half dollars a day. It used to be two dollars a day, but the World Bank changed it because the dollar ain't what it used to be. Right? So you'll say, well, this country, if it were a country, is a poor country. You would immediately say, well, yes, it's poor. But it's not actually all poor. It's a divided country, the famous champagne glass. 80% of its resources, with 20% of its people, it's actually much less now. When Mebubulak first came with the champagne glass versus the bear mug, right? So you will say, yes, it's, it's, it's a poor country, but not everyone is poor. And I'm not talking just rich country, poor country. I'm talking rich people, poor people. You, you had mentioned I live in the U.S. and I'd gone back to Pakistan. When I, was, uh, when I live in the U.S., I work at a place called Boston University. A mile and a half away from it is a place called Roxbury, which is the third world part of the U.S. When I went to Pakistan, I worked in a place called Lums, which is the first world part 
of Lahore, from Isle and a half from it, is something called Bhatta Chok, which is the third world part. So this, this, is, this, this division is not unusual to you, but, but bear with it. So we live in a poor country. We live in a divided country called Earth. We live in a poorly governed country. By everything that we talk about as good governance, if you were to apply that to how we, how we manage global processes, you would come to the conclusion, this is not a well-governed country. All animals equal, five more equal than all others. But you can apply any, any principle that we sell to countries as good governance and apply it to any idea of global governance, and you will come to this, this, this sort of conclusion. You will come to the conclusion, I'm sorry I'm depressing you late at night, but hopefully I'll change that, that you live on an insecure planet. Insecure planet, not just because of con continuous needless war, but insecure because of water insecurity and food insecurity and climate insecurity and every other type of insecurity that abounds. You will come to the conclusion that the country called Earth is not just poor, divided, poorly governed, insecure. It's a degraded planet. That's what we are talking about there. Uh, we drink water out of bottles. The forests are denuded. The Earth is degraded. The climate is changing. Sea level is rising. The things we talk about are, right? As I said, I can tell the other story. I can also tell the story which will also be true of how people live longer, how you can get a vaccine for a new virus within a year or so, and so on and so forth. But this story is also true. You will come to the conclusion that we live on an angry planet. And I do not say that in a, in a bad way. Imagine, actually, not just now, but imagine going back right before COVID. What was on our television screens? A lot of young people, rightly angry, not just here in the UK, in Greece, in Germany, in Chile, in Jordan, in India, in Pakistan, for not finding, not, not feeling that the, the promises made to them were not being fulfilled, including those on climate. We will come to the conclusion that the planet is an unsafe planet. In fact, if the US State Department had a travel advisory based on just these facts, the travel advisory would be, take the first rocket ship out of here. But the problem would be we wouldn't know where to go, uh, at least not yet, though some people are working on it. Why am I doing this to you? Why am I doing this to you? I'm trying to make the argument that when you look at the world from the Pakistani eyes, and Pakistan here means you're not just Pakistan, what you see is a third world planet. Usually that's not a term that I like, but in fact the connotation that we have of what a third world country is very much fits our globe. And part of the challenge we have had in trying to find a solution to global climate change globally is we try to manage it as if we live on planet Sweden. And I wish we did, but we don't. And therefore the politics of the COP the politics of global negotiation remains the politics of, 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 of the third world I described. Please hold that image in your mind as, as I fine tune it and bring it closer to ground and closer also to Pakistan. Uh, coming in that third world planet, the effort to come to an agreement on climate change, the idea that we have a common problem that will affect everyone, and therefore the purpose of global agreement is to come to an agreement that everyone works for everyone. Runs into this idea that we make global agreements by everyone acting sovereignly, meaning I will go and try to get the deal that is best for me. And this wonderful assumption that if every country does that, the sum of everyone trying to do what is best for them will become what is best for everyone. That is the great triumph of hope over experience that we have run now 26 times. We'll do it the 27th time in Egypt, we'll do it the 28th time, and so on and so forth. And, and the most recent example of that was Paris. Out of Paris, two numbers came. I want to move to Pakistan in a minute. Two big numbers came. One number was this. And this, when it first came out, this is 100 billion we kind of didn't even recognize. There were too many zeros. And this was the amount that was supposed to be spent by the world 
on helping developing countries meet up with this challenge that was unequally divided. Now, what I want to talk about this number is something different. When it first came out, no one really believed it. There is not a single developing country person who believed that this would be spent, much as we cry about it. Everyone understood, wink, wink, this, this, is, this is what you say you will do, because there's no track record. But what's interesting about it is in Paris, this seemed like a really big number. Today, in 2021, it's not a really big number. Why? Because 100 billion seemed to be something really big that the world would do. In 2021, we know that a trillion dollar can appear in a week, be spent in nine days. When people and countries actually believe what they are saying, when they actually feel insecure. That's what happened in COVID in the, in, in, in the EU. That's what happened in COVID in China. That's what happened with COVID in the US. The difference was it was really seen as a, as a security problem, which means I have an existential threat to me. Therefore, I'm not going to ask how much it will cost. I'm going to first save myself and then figure out how I make up for whatever was spent. That's how we fight wars. That's how we fought COVID. That is the behavior of all international affairs, I would say, when the threat is truly seen to be existential. And that, to me, is the challenge of climate change. The other number that came out of, COVID, uh, out of Paris that you remember is this one, 1 1.5 to 2. Right? And I'll talk about that. You've, you've heard this again in, in, in the media and a lot. I do want to say, what does it mean? Why do people get worked up about 1.5 degree and 2 degrees? The first, scientifically, and, and there are better people than me here, so, so I hope I'm wrong. I really hope I'm wrong. I really, truly hope I'm wrong. But at this point, there is no evidence whatsoever that we have any chance whatsoever of making 1.5, right? That is 1.5 degree global warming. There really isn't. I, there is, I cannot imagine any way in which that math can work out. I hope I'm wrong. In fact, I would say there's nearly no way or very little way that we have any hope of meeting two. Right? I'll, I'll, I'll come to, 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 to what that means. And this is why I would say we are in the age of adaptation. Now, you have probably heard this many times. 2020 was a year like no other. I don't know how many memos I wrote during COVID to my colleagues and so on and so forth. Thank you for your support in the year like no other. Right? So let's look back at the year like no other and remind ourselves what happened in the year like no other. Here is at least one other thing that happened in the year like no other. It started in January with the hottest January ever recorded. Right? I'm not trying to scare you. I'm actually trying to do something, I hope, rather interesting. I will not give you any figure that's in the future. Right? We usually talk about climate as if it's a future problem, and I'm trying to negate that. This is 2020. We started with January as the hottest January ever recorded. February, second hottest February ever recorded since we've recorded temperatures. March. Uh, March, second hottest March. April, second hottest April. Uh, May, hottest May ever. Uh, you see the trend there. June, hottest. July, second hottest. August, second hottest. September, hottest. De October, third hottest. November, hottest. December, we got a little respite. We made up for it this July, which is the hottest month ever recorded for any month ever. Right? And again, the, what is the point I'm trying to say? If you really look at newspapers, which I did, the first few of these made news. By about May, being the hottest May in ever was really not news. It wasn't even tweet-worthy. Been there, done that. Except if you are in Karachi and living through a heat wave, as at least two million people, the city is, is more, but two million people were directly being threatened by that. Then it's a very real statistic. This is not about a future projection. This is a real, 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 uh, real number. Let me, let me put the same, same real number at what it means for people. By my estimate, back of the envelope, for about two and a half billion people in the world, why climate is a 
issue today, not in the future, including for many, but not all in Pakistan, not all. If you, if you look at this, this is again similar data. This is recorded temperature for every month since we've been keeping temperature. The first circle is the 1.5 line, the second is 2. 27, 1938, 1956, whatever it's, it's, it's running. Right? Again, I, I'm trying to do something which for most of my life I've put in graphs that, have, that end in 2070, 2100. Right? We've trained ourselves to think this is in the future. Why is that a problem? Because once we train ourselves to think this is in the future, we have already convinced ourselves we have time. Right? This ends in, 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 in 2016. You can, you can take it a little further. I don't want anyone, please, to take this simplistically. That just doesn't mean that it will very quickly uh, pass that, because we are talking about average temperatures across time. But the result is undeniable. Now, you say to me, that is all fine, but I don't live on planet Earth. I live in Oxford. You're supposed to tell me what's happening in Pakistan. Same data now, same data for recorded temperature everywhere, but in place. 1909, 1914, 1927, 1938. And you can see the trend. Right? So that is what the climate is telling us. And that is why if you are a poor person especially, but if you are in Pakistan, climate becomes a very different issue than what you are still debating in Copenhagen. Right? And, and, and that's where, where I want to go. But before that, we talked about, about 1.5. By the way, people are familiar with this diagram, right? Uh, it, it's interesting what you can do with data now. This, this is actually the data on recorded temperature for every year. Right? And, and, and the point is, you can see it everywhere that the trend is changing. 1.5. So what's 1.5 between friends? That changes within a day. Right? And, and we know that we are not talking about weather. We are talking about climate. And that means global. So what does 0.5 mean between friends? And what would it mean in a place like Karachi or in a place like Lahore for real people? not just as a policy issue. What can 0.5 degree difference do? Here are some of the things it can do. Extreme heat, according to the IPCC, between a 1.5 difference and a 2 difference, goes up to 2.6 times, 260%. Sea level rise by more than 0.6 meters. Crop yields, 2.3 times worse. Right? Now, this is the climate reality in which developing countries ought to be thinking, Pakistan ought to be thinking. Let me move very rather, well, I, I have one more thing, and then I want to move to what, what this would is meaning already. What, where it brings us is what I've been calling the age of adaptation. Now, age of adaptation does not mean that mitigation is not required. Michael Mann is exactly right. We need to step on mitigation. Mitigation essentially means reducing emissions. Right? But for a country like Pakistan, whose emissions is 1%, you can bring it down to zero. That's not going to change the global problem. That doesn't mean you don't bring it down. You certainly bring it down, and you certainly make sure that the future growth doesn't happen so that you can leapfrog. But the real impact becomes on adapting to the change that's already in the system. And, the, and, and part of the opportunity is also there, right? So in some ways, adaptation to me becomes essentially what you do in the absence of mitigation. It is not the opposite of mitigation, because the less you will mitigate today, the more we will have to adapt tomorrow. We are actually very good at adapting. Pakistan is certainly very good at adapting. You're very good at adapting. The weather changes, I wear a jacket. I pull out a sweater. It rains, I bring an umbrella. Right? That's adaptation. The point about adaptation is every measure of adaptation is cost. And that cost is different on your ability to bear it. The rain, it raineth every day on rich and poor fella, but more upon the rich, uh, because, more on the poor, because the rich has his umbrella. Right? And, and that becomes the new politics of climate, whether it is local 
or international. How did we get here very quickly? And, 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 and then, then I want to move. How did we get here? First of all, it's a failure of wisdom. There's no, no dearth of knowledge. This is one of my all-time favorite graphs. It's, it's old. The new one is even worse. Between 1901 and 2012, 13,950 peer-reviewed papers written on what is called global warming here, only 24 in any way rejected that it is human-induced. You don't have that sort of confidence even in gravity. And yet, especially where I live in the US, there is sort of this sense that we have to first debate it out. Right? So it's a failure of wisdom, but it's not just a failure of wisdom. It is also a failure. It's, it's, it's also at least three, four other forms of failure. It's a failure of negotiation. I am not a fan of COP, including my own in Pakistan's performance in it, partly because it's become a ritualized it's become ritualized. It's, it's, it, this is the 26th. For a quarter century, we've now become very, very good at knowing exactly how it will end. That doesn't mean we don't need cops. We need a different sort of cop, but that we can come to. It is not just a failure of negotiation because of the, this ritualization. It's a failure of vulnerability. You don't need to read everything in this graph. Just look at the colors. Here is the difference between developed and developing countries and those who get hurt by climate and those whose emissions have gone up. Right? So in, in many ways, this figure is the driver of climate politics. Why is it relevant to Pakistan? Because like many countries, it has led to a view amongst many that this is not our problem. Because someone else caused it. Therefore, I should be shouting and saying, you bad, me good, not my problem. But in the age of adaptation, that becomes cutting your own nose to spite your face. That statement is not untrue, but it doesn't lead to the type of actions for the most vulnerable that you would want. It is not just a vulnerability failure, it's a moral failure, and this is where the politics of what's called um, loss and damage comes in. If you look at countries that are the most vulnerable, and in your mind put it next to the countries that have contributed the most. What is not in this map is that the same dynamic is repeated within countries. And that's what we are beginning to see. The same climate injustice that, that people like me talk about in the global level is repeating itself at the domestic level because the dynamics are exactly the same. And finally, it is a failure of politics. And when we talk about the failure of politics, very certainly where I am in the US, it's quite simple to say, well, Mr. Trump messed it. I'm not sure that is in fact true. The politics is that thing that I had talked about earlier. We are trying to come to a global solution on the assumption that every country trying to do what is best for itself will add up to the global good. And, and that becomes the problem. And that brings us to the age of adaptation and to Pakistan and to very local. So what does this translate? for a country like Pakistan, but for many, many others too. Uh, here are the some of the frontline issues that we are already beginning to see. My argument is we are already beginning to see. I want to start with actually the most important one, which is nature. In, in some ways, as was mentioned, I, I've, I've served with, with pride uh, on the board of WWF, and my colleagues there would very often put you know, this picture. When you think about nature and climate, what's the picture that comes to your mind? Exactly, slab of ice and a polar bear on it. And the assumption is the polar bear is waiting for me to come and help it. I have spoken to a few polar bears. They are not waiting. <laughs> they have no faith in us because they have no history of ever us seeing us do that. That is not really what nature does. Nature is much more like this. Nature tries to survive. Nature hits back. In fact, much more than that, nature is like this. That's a dengue mosquito. If you are in Lahore today, you mentioned I was vice chancellor of, 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 of LUMS. The first real issue that came week two of being there was dengue. No one teaches you as a university administrator what to do about dengue in Lahore. Partly because dengue is not supposed to be in Lahore. 
Dengue is supposed to be in Sri Lanka or in Karachi. It's certainly not supposed to be at the foothills of the Himalayas in Gilgit. Now, I, I want to be very clear. That is not, it is not clear whether it's only or how much of it is about climate change because there's more travel, people, vector disease changes because of that. But what is clear is that species adapt, not just humans. And species move. And the mosquito is certainly smart, smarter than us in many, many ways. So nature is important. The much more important in what we've been seeing as the face of climate change, you, you will note you know, mostly when people talk about climate change, what you are expecting to hear is emissions. Right? How much we need to reduce our emissions by, we, we do. But in the age of adaptation, it is not just about emissions. In fact, a lot of adaptation is written in the language of water. And there's a reason for it. When we are talking mitigation, essentially you're saying reduce emissions, right? We are carbon managers. Because that's causing the problem. If I can reduce my carbon, the world is in a better place. That is exactly true. Right? Therefore, most of mitigation language is the language of carbon management. Therefore, nearly all of the international negotiation is in the language of carbon management. The point I'm trying to make is, if you are looking at this from Pakistan, that language is less and less, it's not that it is less relevant, but you are overwhelmed by another language of climate that the international community is just not talking enough about. In particular, the language of water. Why water? I have argued that water is to adaptation what carbon was to mitigation. Think about it this way. What happens because of climate impacts? Not what causes climate change, but what happens if climate changes? Many of the things that happen are about water. Water rises, sea level rise. Water melts, glaciers. Water disappears, drought. Water falls from the sky like no one's business. Extreme events. The point I'm trying to make is if you're looking at climate change from Pakistani or many developing country, uh, not just developing, but a particular type of developing country eyes, climate becomes a water issue as much as a carbon issue. And you listen to the global discourse on it which is still only climate fixated. Again, I have to be very careful. This is not to say not to focus on emissions. But that's a different problem for a different set of people. Now, what does water mean? This is from 20, uh, 2010, uh, when the floods came in Pakistan. Many of you know about 2010 floods. What we don't even talk about much, including in Pakistan, that flood didn't stop. We just stopped talking about it. So for eight years after that, you had higher than average floods that continued. Because that's, this, is the, this is the link to climate. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how much of the flood was because of climate. Pakistan knows floods from before. But what climate change does to uh, so-called natural disasters is that the amplitude changes and the frequency changes. You see more of them more frequently, and you see the amplitude changing again and again. And Pakistan has been in a constant state of flood as well as drought for now nearly a decade running. I'll, I'll come to that. But, but, but think about this. When, when this came, um, you've probably seen this. That's all the fresh water in the world. That's more than enough fresh water, actually. But the problem is access. I don't want to talk about that. I want to, people to understand what floods mean for people. It's, it's not my basement flooding. So when this happened, friends and I were trying to sort of raise support for people who, who were homeless because of floods, and I realized people really didn't understand what a flood meant in, in a large alluvial country like Pakistan. People did, kind of. So I took the map of Pakistan. If you look at the blue area, that's the 2010 flood. Just keep in your mind that blue squiggle. That's the areas most affected by the flood in 2010. I took that to scale and put it on the map of the US to explain the magnitude just in terms of size. Right? And that's from one corner to the border of, 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 of Canada to Florida. I put the same thing on a map of Japan. It covers the whole country. The same squiggle put on a map of, 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 of Europe, from Denmark down to Spain. 
So, so, so when we are talking about impacts of climate, the question of, of whether this is about climate or not, and the sci scientific sort of quibble about that is very, very important. But if it is happening more and more frequently, as it is, and if the amplitude has changed, then for real people, it is something that they have to start, 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 start dealing with. If you're talking about water, you are immediately talking about food. So the front line of climate change already in Pakistan, as in other countries, becomes food. Because what is water, uh, food except nature's way of packaging water? Not really, but kind of. Right? Particularly in a country like Pakistan. And, and that becomes a very different economic issue, deal than energy management. And you get Pakistan and other countries in this fix where the international system is doing, saying, give us your NDCs and what you are doing about carbon management, when the challenges they are also facing are about food, are about agriculture, are about water. Right? Th that's, that's the challenge here. Energy, of course, is important. It's important in the emissions way that I, I mentioned. But for many countries, and certainly for Pakistan, right? Uh, I don't know how many Pakistanis there are here, but for all of us who are Pakistanis, load shedding is a word. Right? And it's not about what you do before you get on a plane to reduce the size of your baggage. Right? It, is, it, is, it is how you manage life. It is as important as seasons are to people. If you're going to get married, you figure out when electricity is going to be there or not. Right? It becomes a real thing. And more than that real thing is the question of energy poverty. Again, I'm treading on very slippery ground here because this has become a contentious issue. There are friends of mine who say you should never talk about energy poverty because energy poverty, you are saying, we have to continue fossil fuel. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, as we leapfrog to better renewable energies, there is a cost to that. And that two and a half billion people I'm talking about are not going to be able to pay those, that cost. It is not that they want to stick to fossil fuels. It is that they are not going to get the batteries that my Tesla runs on. And we are going to get a discourse where they become the problem. I changed. I went and got a hybrid. I went and got a, got a Tesla. I have solar panels on my roof. You don't. You bad, me good. The argument shifts. Right? That is why energy poverty is important. In fact, I think some of the best news that's happened on climate is about energy. And it's this, this, essentially this graph about, about prices. I think coal will go away. It doesn't matter if COP26 sort of has, what, what was the word play? Uh, phase down, phase down. Phase down, phase out. Thank you. Write your 27 op-eds on out and down. But for that two and a half billion people, the issue is energy poverty. It is energy as an input into development. I don't care where my energy comes from. But there is a price we are putting at, at the new. And in some ways, I hope what will happen is what happened to our cell phones where we were able to leapfrog. Right? That's the discussion that if I were the government of Pakistan, I would be pushing at, at, at COP26. So the point here again is that we have to think about climate in a different way once you start looking at it from a country like Pakistan. This is, this is not to say that the, the, the global discourse is wrong. We need to make climate a Pakistan issue. And, and those are the type of things that you, that you need to start then doing if, if you're doing. Transport, right? Mobility. Mobility is a key element in the, uh, in, in, in the carbon transition. Look at the discourse within Pakistan and outside on mobility. Pakistan has a major new electric vehicle policy but not really a mass transit policy. Because we are being pushed, this is not to blame. We are responding to an international climate where the, 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 the good housekeeping badge you get, the Boy Scout badge you get, is for jumping up on EV. 
The transit problem in Pakistan is not just emission. The transit problem in Pakistan is this. Right? And, and climate is an opportunity. Again, this is not to say not to do the other thing. This is to say that the climate debate will be better if it becomes a development debate. And I'll, I'll, I'll come to this, this, this as, I, as I begin ending. Uh, so, so, so mobility becomes a different issue. You can go down all of these, I won't, but infrastructure. Right? What you're doing with the college. But infrastructure in, in many developing countries like Pakistan is this. If Nepal can have a third of households with rooftop solar for hot water uh, home, home heating, there is an opportunity for a lot of other places in the world right, to, to rethink. I won't even go into ecosystems and fires because in many ways, uh, for time reasons, but what I do want to go into is heat. Right? We, we, we hear the headlines about fire. We don't hear the headlines about heat. And again, this is not to blame. This is Pakistan's fault itself. This is India's fault itself. If, if you have been reading what's been happening across South Asia, that's the front line of global climate change. That's the front line of global climate change if you are living in Karachi. There is no reason why 600 people should die of heat. They don't die essentially of heat only. What they die of is bad city planning. What they die of is not enough hydration options in, in the cities. But the heat is, and if I, if I, if I can just put some, some photographs of what you've now been seeing eight summers in a row, eight summers in a row across South Asia is, is this constant new heat pattern where you are essentially not only seeing things like this of, of, of how people are coping with, with heat, but what you're really seeing is literally mass graves. And again, this is, this is, this, this is an, well, I, I would hate to say this is an opportunity, but this is a problem that should not happen. Right? So if one is serious about climate change, if one is serious about adaptation, we need to start thinking. That, that, that's a true photograph. That's, that's not a cartoon. Right? And again, Pakistan is not thinking about it. This has stopped making news. For, for those of you who are from either Pakistan or India, just look at how heat waves have been covered over the last six, seven years. The first few times it is big news, then it is standard process. This is the new normal, much like we are dealing with COVID. Let me, let me start ending up. Refugees. We've heard a lot about refugees. We haven't yet seen that in Pakistan. We are seeing this beginning in certainly Bangladesh and the Sundarbans. But when we think of refugees and climate, we usually think of some disaster and then lots of people move. Right? Climate migration is, un is not likely to be just like that. It's much more like economic migration. What you lose is livelihood. When you lose livelihood, the strongest, the youngest, the smartest go somewhere else for livelihood. Right? The example here is from Bangladesh, not Pakistan, but it's, it's an interesting one. Micromillimeter change where sea wet water and fresh water meet. Micromillimeter change, what will that do? What that does is that the shrimp I am dependent on moves further. I now no longer have access to shrimping. That's the livelihood change. What do you do? You move for the Sundarbans to Chittagong then possibly to Calcutta, right? So, 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 so again, uh, uh, refugees becomes a different sort of problem. Let me, let me because I, I, I am taking too long and having too much fun, um, move towards ending this by thinking about security. River or river, you are my father, you are my mother. I am the fruit of your womb.
दरिया दरिया जंगल दसावे शेड ऑफ द फॉरेस्ट दरिया ओ दरिया जंगल दसावे कहीं दी तो सी खुशी साधे नामे खुशी साधे When those are gone, Daria, oh, Daria, all happiness is gone. I, I, I want to end with this part that society, that societies are defined by climate. It's not just Pakistan, but in Pakistan, it's actually particularly clear. There's the Himalayas, there's the monsoon system. The monsoon system comes, hits the Himalayas. creates essentially enough monsoon that what is an arid country suddenly starts thinking of itself as as an agricultural superpower you change that system and everything goes out of balance that is why water is important let me let me as i as i as i move towards ending tell a different story about this does anyone here especially pakistanis recognize this picture anyone you might even have it in your whatsapp if you are one of those whatsapp people Pakistanis are very proud of this. How beautiful is Pakistan? It is beautiful. It's a place called Atabat. There's a beautiful lake in Atabat. Pakistanis love to share photographs of Atabat because it's beautiful. It's, it's this pristine water. It could be Iceland. And the reason the water is pristine is that till 2010 there was no Atabat lake. There was a village called Atabat. This is not exactly climate change this was a glacial slide but here is the security question that i ask my pakistani colleagues including people in the military who i presented this to if you had a village and a supposed enemy came and took over that village and that village no longer existed what would be the political response the political response to this is taking selfies right and that is the security challenge that 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 question i had raised about climate development and security last slide and then i do promise well one one more after this and then i end how does security become a climate and development problem this is from earlier work work a 2006 book uh, 2003 book uh, but but a framework of how to think about security and and development and climate the argument we were making was when you look at the security literature it is essentially about about what creates insecurity i hit you violence to i don't hit you but social disruption happens that makes you feel insecure to where it happens from the state to society very very simply without going into all of the details if it is violence at the state level it is clearly security because what it is about is war if it is violence at society it is civil strife which we know has been happening much more than even war right it gets more interesting here when it is social disruption at the state level insecurity comes from institutional failure that's what load shedding is so when you get these stresses climatic and others the pressure they put is on institutions when institutions already fragile fail that translates into human in, 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 into insecurity right that's that's the cycle of how climate becomes insecure and when it is social disruption at society what you are talking about uh, is is human security war because of climate unlikely civil strife because of climate may be already seeing certainly there are those including here who have argued that we might have been already seeing this in africa and in parts of asia institutional failure is already happening when you have load shedding for example that is a livelihood challenge that makes you insecure and i i i won't go into it for time and same same for human insecurity if that is is what it is let me leave you with my final final thought what should pakistan do about climate development and security just a few ideas one countries like pakistan need to move from a reactive posture to a preventative posture which is which is there is it is clear that these adaptation things are going to come 
This is not about giving in, this is about making development better. And again, for time reasons, I'll just keep it to that. Moving from maximizing security, which has been our national narrative, to minimizing insecurity. Moving from thinking of development as a problem, especially in the climate discourse, where development is supposedly the cause of the problem, it is for many reasons. But to thinking about development or good development, sustainable development as a solution, but, but thinking hard in that way. And from most difficult, from thinking about climate as climate assistance to thinking about climate as climate justice. This goes into the questions of loss and, loss and damage, but this also goes into climate justice within societies, not just internationally, but within societies. Uh, thank you so much for bearing with me. I apologize for going on and on, but I'll be happy to, happy to discuss this, this, this more. Thank you. Absolutely fantastic. We're just gonna get, I think, a, a microphone if anyone has questions. We've got maybe five, 10 minutes for questions here. Does anyone like to start the ball rolling? Yes, please, if you could just wait for the mic to come and Adir, if you could say who you are. Um, thank you for this beautiful presentation. I'm already a fan <laughs> of the way you are presenting. And uh, I'm from Bangladesh, so you can obviously understand that um, in 50 years, uh, we have come from a uh, low-income country to more lower-middle-income country. But in the next 50 years, there might not be a place uh, called Bangladesh. Um, so thanks for saying that. Um, I wanted to ask you what would be some of the strategy for countries like Bangladesh and Malaysia, uh, Maldives going forward, or even Pakistan, um, to put um, the countries who are actually responsible uh, for the pollution. We contribute very little to pollution, but are the worst sufferers. So just wanted to know um, your uh, ideas on that. You want to take a couple of questions and I can wrap them yeah. together? Yeah. So yeah, let's have another one here from Benito. Thank you very much, Adil. Wonderful. Absolutely excellent. Uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to be a bit optimistic. If you're in this ball game, you have to be, otherwise you... <laughs> yeah. I was just wondering, I mean, to me, the pandemic has brought something very close, namely the interconnectedness of us all. From a virus coming from somewhere across the world, all of a sudden impacts are everywhere, and we do depend on each other. Do you think this sort of appreciation, I think which most people will have now, that we can't do, deal with this on our own, will have an impact on how we deal with climate change at the global level? Thank you. I mean, the well, other will come, but why don't you answer that uh, and then we'll take uh, it. Very, very quickly. Uh, first of all, I hope you're wrong and that there won't be a Bangladesh. I, I, I am confident that, that, that will be. I, I have no doubt, we are a very smart species. I, I think we will, to your optimism, I think we will lick it. I, I think we will lick it late, and I think we will lick it not for everyone, because while we are very, very smart as a species, we are not very wise. That's the problem. So I hope, I hope on that one it won't happen. Strategy on what to do. My general response to my Pakistani colleagues is Pakistan should really do what Bangladesh is doing. Because I do think, I, I'm not just trying to be diplomatic, I think amongst developing countries, uh, Bangladesh has a much better uh, sense of it because of a number of really good people of making it a Bangladeshi problem, of, of, of saying we will, we, will, we will do the global stuff, but this is essentially our challenge for our people, right? And, and that's, that's where what to do. Part of what to do, I think, is what Benito is saying. I'm, I'm also an optimist because, you know, you can't be in this business and, 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 and not be. It's a survival strategy. Right? right or wrong, so optimism is a survival strategy. And, and to me, I think the, the th point of the slide before that, and I'm sorry that my time management was so bad, is there is an opportunity for development. Right? If, if, if I'm really being radical here, and I think I am, I have tried to change this narrative from what we've usually, I've been trained and I train my students as development is the problem to a different type of development is the solution. There is opportunity in adaptation, especially for developing countries, the same way as moving to cell phones was an opportunity. 
The opportunity is, as we did for cell phones, not going through the landline, but doing that leapfrogging, right? That's the $100 billion question. The $100 billion question is the leapfrogging. And, and I, I think there is an opportunity. On your other part of optimism, I'm not so sure. I hope you are right. What did COVID teach us? COVID taught us, A, the money is there. Anyone who says this is expensive, you're lying. You found a trillion dollars in a week. You spent a trillion dollars in nine days. You didn't even notice. Right? That's the good news. The bad news is, I don't think people are acting as if they really take this seriously. Everyone says the right thing. I'm, I'm very happy to go on the climate march. But am I willing and able to change my own lifestyle? I have not yet seen the evidence, right? The Tesla proposition is give me a car that is as cool, as fast, even nicer, and runs on battery, and I will go for it. If you ask me to change my buying habits, I'm still going to, I'm not going to own a car, I'm just going to use Uber, right? That's the challenge for my generation in the next one. COVID taught us that science is great. You can get a vaccine faster and it will work better. Problem A, there will not be a vaccine for climate change. Problem B, we got the vaccine instead of doing the prevention. Everyone could have told you that pandemics are coming, but we didn't act enough in time. Third, point of optimism, I hope you are wrong, uh, you're right, I hope I'm wrong. I did not see the world coming together. The first casualty of COVID was multilateralism. Try to remember when was the last time we saw the head of WHO on television. I think it was the day he declared it a global pandemic. After that, everyone for themselves. I hope that the lesson we learned from that is that that is really expensive that the better way is the multilateral way. So let's take a couple more. Uh, so let's go to, thank you, yes, Mike. Hi. Uh, I think you gave my question. Use the classroom voice. So that people on the um, internet can hear. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. This was so gripping. And I really like the focus on the here and now aspect of climate change and also making it uh, us think about the planet as one country. So that brings me to my question about governance, and we've seen uh, all of the results of COP, some positive, but also a lot of frustrations. Uh, moving forward, countries like Pakistan, how they uh, engage with that, uh, with those conferences, with COP, with uh, these policies, what would your, what is your prediction, first of all, and what would your suggestion be for developing countries uh, when they move forward in these conferences? Thank you. Um, last year, uh, Pakistan approved uh, the renewable energy policy, um, and, and 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 it provided opportunity for foreign investors to come in and invest in Pakistan. Uh, but sadly, nobody apart from China is willing to do that, and Pakistan itself is not in a position where they're able to fund renewable energy projects for themselves. So this policy is quite ambitious. And, and I, I, I think it's on the right track. But what framework would you suggest for Pakistan to, to adopt and work on it? Uh, uh, should I or? Yeah. Um, COP. There are people here who know much more than that, and I, I don't want to put my foot in my mouth, but let me try to put my foot in my mouth. Uh, <laughs> I, I am a creature of the COPs. I, until Copenhagen, I was at nearly every every one of them. Then I figured out the game. I was adding more pollution to it. Uh, not because people are, pe they're very good people, they're really well-meaning people, but it's become ritualized. Uh, and countries like Pakistan are themselves to blame. Countries like Pakistan, developing countries go there thinking they'll get money. Knowing, it's, it's like a mo movie we've seen 26 times, as if the ending will change this time. Look up the recording, the reporting that happens after every COP. You know, someone should do an article on that. It would be really cool. It's the exact same thing that frustrates it. It is the exact same thing that gives us hope. I was on a podcast the other day. They said, well, but this time they, they, they said we will talk about money. 
And I said, let me remind you the other cops when they talked about, they said they will talk about money. Cop one, cop two, cop three, cop four, cop five, I can count till 26. Right? So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying cops, cops are bad, but I think we need to think a different way about cops. First, give them, a, give them an expiry date. International negotiation was much better when you had a treaty and you said, okay, by this time I'm going to come up with a treaty, good or bad. Right? Give it an expiry date, give it in two years, give it whatever, get a treaty, good or bad, and out. Second, I don't want any new promise. If I were the government of Pakistan, I want no new promise. All I want is previous promises be fulfilled. Uh, I'm a professor, and I'm sure there are others here. I, I know, I used to, when I was a student, be really good at getting incompletes. The way you get an incomplete is you go to the professor and say, I can't finish this on time, but if you give me more time, I will do an even better paper. And we've been doing that same game for 26 years. So no more promises. Simply take what the countries have promised, and the purpose of the COP should be to see who has fulfilled their homework and who has not. Right? Simply that. A lot of blame is for countries like Pakistan itself, developing countries in general, because there is this, this amazing sort of triumph of hope over experience again, as if somehow we can get development assistance out of this. A, you won't. B, if you did, that's not what's going to change things. Right? And that goes to sort of your, your renewable. Uh, the policy is not, not bad. I, I do think that there are a number of things this, as well as the previous government, have tried to do. The good thing living in the U.S. is in, when I go to Pakistan, there is no debate about climate is real or not. It, it's very interesting. There may be people who don't know about it. But denial is really not a thing because, because you see it around you. The question is policy. The renewable policy, partly, I think, here is my little critique of it. Not in a bad way. I think it was in good faith and good thing. But it was essentially made as is very often in developing countries, as an investment policy, rather than as energy policy. I'm looking at the world, people are making renewables, can I get a piece of that pie? No, you won't. If I'm making an investment, I'm going to go where investment is safe, where rules are stable, where markets are large. If you're doing energy policy, then I do think we'll wrap our heads somewhat differently. First of all, we would also ask the coal question and not sideline it. Second, on renewables, and I just don't know, and maybe a deal can, can, can and, and people, economists can, can, can do better. If, if the price of solar in Abu Dhabi is less than the price of coal today, why is the price of solar in Pakistan so high? Right? That's the structural shift that will happen. It won't happen from investment policy. It will happen from energy policy. For example, in what you're doing here at Wolfson, right? I was reading your thing. The, the thing I like best is the first item there is windows. My favorite solution for Pakistan has been windows. You build these fancy houses, sit in what's called the drawing room, and lament how much you have to pay in your energy bill. And you have this thin paper, thin window, which is essentially a device for taking your money and throwing it out. Right? Because you cool it, heat it artificially at very high cost, and then let it fly. That's the policy I would do on energy. But I, I think I know why it doesn't work. You would need standardized measures for windows so that I can go to a shop, pick a window, change it for a better one. If every window is different size, then, then the economics changes. But that sort of thing, if I can give my, my favorite example, right? Which, it's not just Pakistan, but it's, it's a good one. And I, I, I give it in the best faith. In, in Pakistan, we have this something called geezer. Do you guys have geezers? Geezers. So in America, geezer is someone who's very old and nasty, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but in Pakistan, geezer is a water heating device, yeah. right? It's a, it's, a, it's a water heater. And in Islamabad or in a cold place, you will put the water heater, the geezer, outside in the cold. Right? Then you will burn money underneath it in gas. There will be a pipe that will go outside the house, all around the house, come back into the bathroom and give me water. But by the time it has gone there, it has been cooled. So I put shaving cream on my face and wait for that hot water that has cooled to become hot again. Right? This is, this is, this is simpler development policy. 
There is a reason why in this country, very often those water heaters are in the bathroom itself. In the US, they are in the basement if you have a basement. Right? Now, I'm not saying the, the things are simple. What I'm saying is you have to have a different mindset about energy when you think about it as energy versus when you think about it as investment. We've done that well. Remember when you had cars running on CNG? Bad idea otherwise. But there was a reason why so much of the country moved to it very, very quickly, because people do respond to what is good for them. Right? So, so in a way, you have to sort of flip how you think about policy. It's not a question of what the policy is, but how you think about policy and what you are trying to do. Sorry for the long answer again. I, I fear we do need to draw it to a close because people are busy and um, we could carry on for a long time. Those of you who are coming on to dinner, you're very welcome to join us for drinks and carry on talking. Um, the, the purpose of these, this lecture series is that people sitting in Oxford can see the world from a Pakistani perspective. And I think here we do a lot of thinking about climate change, and we do a lot of it thinking about it from an Oxford and a British perspective. I think what you've given us tonight is a very different view of that issue from the perspective of Pakistan, but from the perspective of most people in the world. And for that, I'm very, very grateful, and thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs>